welcome everyone to today's webinar on reducing hand injuries in construction brought to you by Superior Glove. I am Todd Humber. I'm the senior editor for OHS Canada, and I will be your host for today's discussion. Before I introduce our speaker, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. You, the audience, are in listen-only mode. That means we can't see or hear you, but we definitely want to hear from you. You will see a Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. We encourage you to pose questions at any time. We've got some time at the end of today's presentation to field your questions. This webinar is also being recorded. You will receive a copy of it in the coming days from Superior Glove, so look for that in your inbox. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the star of today's show. Ian Lamfer is North American Construction Specialist at Superior Glove. He has a long history of working in both the construction and building materials industry. So Ian, over to you and welcome. Thank you, Todd. I appreciate the time and I appreciate everyone coming out. Um, appreciate you guys joining us today. So during our discussion, we're going to discuss how we work and how we are working with contractors to improve the safety culture within the construction industry. Uh, our discussion today applies to the construction industry, but you know, keep in mind it can be ap applicable for any industry that has a prime or general contractor scenario as well as a trade partner or subcontractor situation. There's always ways to work together to figure things out um, and to work effectively together. But as Todd said, just to give you a little brief background, I spent um, 10 years in the construction industry working uh, in building materials. Um, so I was involved in everything from uh, design development phase to write-in specifications uh, running pre-construction meetings, uh, pre-bid meetings, to essentially project managing uh, building envelope projects from conception to handoff to the owner uh, in completion. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I've seen a lot of different things, obviously not everything because it, it is a vast field as, as we all know. But uh, we're going to get into it here and, and uh, kind of share what we're doing here at Superior Glove and how, you know, we work with construction just a little differently. Before we do that, though, I want to you know, get into the main part of the presentation. I wanted to give you kind of a brief overview of, of Superior Glove and what it is we do. If you don't already know us, uh, you probably guessed from our name that we manufacture gloves. Uh, we've been doing this for over 100 years, uh, since 1910. And Tony and Joe Gang, who are pictured here, are brothers whose dad bought Superior Glove back in 1961. It's been a family owned and operated uh, business ever since with Joe and Tony now managing the day-to-day -day operations. Joe, who, who's, who's uh, standing in back, leads the sales and marketing uh, group, while Tony heads up product development in the manufacturing. So, you know, in the hand safety industry, we're essentially known for being a lead innovator. Um, at Superior Glove, we actually have a large active in-house research and development team that's constantly looking for ways to improve hand protection and making it more effective and more comfortable. Uh, we're also pretty lucky, especially given you know, the current years of pandemics, but we're lucky to have four manufacturing plants that we own and operate in Ontario and Newfoundland, Canada, as well as Honduras. And the Honduras plants actually doubled in size since the pandemic. So, I'd like to say we're ahead of the curve when it came to onshoring and nearshoring uh, products due to some of the supply chain issues. So it's certainly something that we're aware of and, and working towards uh, you know, making that a little more effective. So as a lead innovator, you know, we have a glove for just about every hazardous situation you can imagine, especially in construction. This slide is a great representation of those types of hazards that the construction workers face on a daily basis uh, at those job sites. Our mission as a company is really for solving hand safety problems and has led us to develop the industry's largest hand protection offering. Uh, with that being, we develop 40 to 50 new products a year and try and fill the gaps in the marketplace that we find. Part of my role as the uh, North American construction specialist is really as I go out working with general contractors, subcontractors and folks in the construction world is to look for gaps like that, to identify areas where there might be a, a need for a, a product that is just not being uh, developed or created. And as a company that's our size, 
we have the ability being as nimble as we are to be able to come up with some new prototypes and get those out into the field rather fast. So that's another hat that, that I wear and, and certainly something we look for the opportunity to, to fill those voids in the market. So, however, before I want to get going into this, I'd like to kind of take a look at, you know, um, some of the, the markets that, that are out there and, and what, what we're seeing in the construction market within the U.S. and Canada. Here's some pretty interesting statistics out there that you might not be aware of. Uh, in Canadian construction, uh, you know, Canadian construction employs 1.4 million people. And what we're seeing is that that represents 7.1% of the population of Canada. That's a pretty big percentage. And it generates $1. Uh, $141 billion in annual revenue with, um, you know, sadly, though we're seeing 900 construction worker deaths just in 2019 alone. And that's according to some statistics I got from keyinbridges.com. In 2018, there were 7,915 loss claims in the construction industry. So, I mean, we all kind of generally know what a you know what it costs our companies to to have someone missing from work or have an injury or reportables. Yeah, you, know, you multiply that by a few thousand dollars in, in per injury, that that adds up to some substantial numbers. I think it, the last count was almost twenty four million dollars just in injuries, just at a three thousand dollar claim. In the U.S. construction market, you know, you see some pretty big. Uh, statistical data on that, we have 745,000 construction uh, employers or contractors with 7.6 million workers uh, in construction. But this statistic really um, kind of bothered me when I realized that one in five work-related deaths, 20% of U.S. work-related deaths occurred in the construction industry. And that comes from BigRents.com. That was kind of a real staggering stat. And each year, 1.1% of construction workers suffers an injury serious enough to miss work. So that's about 84,000 workers a year missing work uh, because of a serious injury. And here's a stat that I actually confirmed with a lot of the different um, partners that I work with is that you know, they all kind of agreed that this, this is pretty on track, but more than 25% of construction workers have indicated that they failed to report an injury. So if you, if you add that to the already, you know, 84,000 workers missing in work with injuries, that that's a pretty large number. Um, you know, and in 2020, there were 174,100 cases of injuries in the workplace, and they cost an excess of $170 billion a year with all those industries. So on average, as I've talked to companies out there, they spend about 3.6% of their budget on injuries, but they're only spending 2.6% on safety training, which I think that, that statistic alone highlights a, a big problem that we're facing. So given some of those big picture injury statistics we just looked at, I think what we need to do is take a look at some of the obstacles that we're facing causing this. Um, why are we not protecting our hands? You know, and that's a great question to ask. You know, sorry about that. Skipped ahead here. Um, so part of that is the physical barriers. You know, they're not comfortable. Uh, they're not able to perform the tasks with, with the gloves that they have, either poor sizing or the wrong glove. Um, some availability errors, uh, barriers out there rather, you know, cost to employers that, you know, obviously that comes up, but the inconvenience, um, I can tell you on job sites I've been on, um, you see workers that, that they're missing a glove or they're missing their gloves and, oh, I laid them down somewhere. I can't find them. Well, why don't you have a new pair? I got to wait for uh, my supervisor to go to the Connex box which is on the other side of the project. So he has to take a, a four wheeler or a, a little side by side over to get that stuff, but he's tied up in the meeting. So this worker has got to work for close to two to three hours, maybe without any type of protection whatsoever. That type of exposure 
you know, we're, we're coming up with all sorts of reasons not to, you know, we need to start looking at, at reasons too. And I think one of the things that we can all agree on is that we're facing a shortage of, of uh, you know, skilled trades labor in the industry. And if we do not protect them properly, you know, those new people coming in, are we gonna, how long are we gonna keep those new people? The more I go around and I talk to the construction uh, folks and the safety construction folks out there, it generally is you newer workers or your apprentices. First few years on the job, just have generally have a higher rate of injury. And if we're not protecting them properly, how long are they gonna stay? More importantly, they're not gonna bring friends into it. They're not gonna recommend that somebody goes into that trade. So we really need to work at, at trying to protect our people better and, and keep those injuries, injuries down because it really is how we keep our workforce and it's how we grow our workforce. And it's really not about it changing what they wear, but it's about changing the culture and creating one where it's a safety centric culture. That culture shift starts at the top. And it, it's the responsibility of the general contractors out there, those prime contractors to set the tone and bring that education and knowledge that they've gained down to their subcontractors, their trade partners. So, we talk about culture. In order to change that culture, we first need to take a look at how we've traditionally procured our safety products and maybe why that culture has failed us. And this short sightedness might actually be counterproductive to our goals in achieving our goals in safety. So, in this slide, you can see the shortfalls of the way that we've traditionally procured PPE. This approach leads to a cost focused approach rather than a hazard-centric or application-centric approach. We as manufacturers and distributors, essentially we've been taught to sell to the industry the way that they've wanted us to. So as you see here, you got a distributor rep or a manufacturer rep and they visit a job site, they get brought in for some reason and they connect with a foreman or a trade supervisor who says, hey, listen, you know, you got a glove that's uh, cost less or this that works better you know, that holy grail of a glove or a piece of PPE. So essentially what we end up doing is we end up quoting or sending in samples on a crossover without actually even looking at the application. We're not even sure if it's the right glove that they're using to begin with, but we're, you know, we're crossing in our glove for a glove that they're using without even knowing if that's even the right one. So let's say that rep sells a few dozen gloves and, and then, you know, eventually starts to meet with some of the safety people on site. They start to build rapport with that safety supervisor and start to build that relationship. But before that even gets any further and starts to really make an effect change with the culture, that job ends or that safety super moves to a new job site out of the territory. So essentially what we're doing is we're starting this repetitive cycle over and over again. And in the end, we have to ask ourselves, are we really affecting change any uh, with that approach? Or are we really influencing the culture from that perspective? And, and I think it's easy to say no. So let's look at what we know already. We have that, you know, and when we ask ourselves why we're still seeing the trends, you know, in injury reduction, you know, that we are, you know, we know now more than ever, gloves are being worn in construction. I see that as I go out there and they're being worn by all different trades. And I can assure you as, as a manufacturer, technologies are constantly improved to make gloves more dexterous, more durable, more features and benefits like touchscreen compatibility, waterproof, impact protection. So those technologies are improving yet we don't see that same trend in the decrease of injuries. And why is that? I think really what it comes down to is, uh, you know, we all know the definition of insanity is when we start to do the same things over and over again, expecting a different result. And we seem to be doing that. Our procurement habits are based on price rather than based on hazard focus or application focus. So essentially we're selling to that construction market the exact way that they programmed us to do that. And what we are doing at, at Superior Glove is we, we took a step back and we said, we need to think outside the box. 
We need to have a different approach if we're going to truly affect change from a cultural standpoint um, in safety within construction. So again, you know, not to, to beat a dead horse, so to speak, but you have to ask why is hand safety so challenging? Well, high hand injury rates, you know, construction has the second highest hand injury rate of all trades out there or all, all verticals, you know. And as I go around, these are some real uh, things that I'm hearing on sites is that, you know, it creates a sense that hand injuries are expected. You hear guys telling us and, and, and girls telling us that, uh, you know, it's just part of the job. It's part of the nature of the job. It's what I do. I mean, I got to be able to do my job and it's just what I do, you know. And some of the subcontractors, you know, from that standpoint, I think our prime contractors can be a little, a little intimidated by bringing that, that information down, by trying to influence change. Or, you know, that, that safety, you know, culture isn't there and it's not communicated from the prime contractor down to the subcontractor. You know, I think we see that we're losing people once again um, to different, different industries because we can't keep people in the trades and we can't attract new people. So again, if we want to keep them long term, I think we really need to look at how we're approaching their safety and what's in it for them. Because it really is about changing the culture and creating one where it's safety centric. And that culture shift starts at the top. And it is the responsibility of those prime contractors and those who have more knowledge and more influence in the industry to set that tone. So how do we do that? Well, what is, what is really hurting us in that realm? I think it's a lack of hand safety specificity. And I talked about, you know, the time that I spent where I actually wrote specs. And so how do we create a culture focused on an application centric approach to providing, you know, hand safety? One of the biggest challenges is that, you know, we've discovered our work with various prime contractors is the use of very vague language in the specification and safety plans. And in the construction industry, we all know that the specification is quote unquote the Bible. It's what's followed. Somebody wants a change order, they read something in the spec, they're gonna have to make a change order. You know, but when we leave things open to interpretation, it does really allow for failed compliance and a true lack of understanding. And I wanted to share with you some real language that I took from you know, a very, very large general contractor in North America. And on the left, you can see this was language within their contractual documents. And as you see, subsection G is where it calls out gloves. And it says 100% EN level four cut resistant gloves or task specific gloves according to the SDS. Now, a couple problems with that right out of the gate. Here in North America, we really adhere to the ANSI standard, which there's no mention of. But it also references a chemical data sheet. So really, someone could read this as saying, I only need to wear gloves, cut gloves, when I'm using chemicals. Because there's no reference to other hazards. There's no reference to you know, task specification as it comes to a hazard. And you look over here to the right, this is in their safety plan. And you know, when I was doing projects and managing projects, I'd have to review safety plans. And this cut four safety gloves is pretty vague. So how do we you know, work to try to build better language? How do we take a step back and not only provide the education, but provide the guidance because this is what they are following. So where do we start? Well, everything does start with having standards and, it take, and taking a hazard centric approach to identifying the right solution for the right task. Understanding those ANSI standards is a great place to begin. Um, and this is, you know, some of the performance standards that we talk about. One of the things we're going to provide you is a guide. After this, it will be sent out to you, um, you know, as, as we'd said in the beginning, that you're going to get a guide that's going to help you to understand cut, you know, ANSI cut standards, impact standard, abrasion, puncture, heat, all of the different 
hazards and tasks that you guys are dealing with, this is a great place to begin. And what's good about it is it's great for safety team trainings. It's great for toolbox talks and really overall understanding to kind of start the foundation to build a safety plan or safety program within your company. But where did that philosophy begin? Well, philosophy and our approach really began, um, you know, with this. While we know there's no shortage of gloves on the market, workers are, are still getting injured. Um, you know, just randomly using an ANSI standard is, you know, without doing trials, without, you know, trying to match up hazards, it's not really always enough. In fact, sometimes it can be a little counterproductive. So if you're throwing gloves at a problem without taking a deeper dive, it really isn't always the answer. And so as surprising as this may sound for a company that manufactures gloves like we do, we, we really don't see PPE as a silver bullet solution for reducing hand injuries. In fact, Joe Gang, um, he's pictured here, one of our owners, wrote a book to drive this point home because he saw so many companies struggling to reduce injuries despite the plentiful amount of PPE out there. Um, the book isn't really about PPE. Instead, it focuses on practical ways that real safety managers have reduced hand injuries at their companies by 50 or even he's seen up to 90%. So it provides practical ways to get workers to willingly change their behavior and shift their culture. And it's based on things real safety manager, managers have had success in implementing. So we do see the challenges. You know, it's about really more than just wearing the gloves. It's about the culture. It's about motivation. It's about leadership and wearing the right glove for the right task. Um, and I think you're going to hear as we talk more in this presentation, it is about creating a culture, excuse me, where everyone can feel safe and everyone is empowered to make safe decisions and safe choices. Um, one thing we're going to open up to you is we're going to send you uh, the ability to get a free copy of this book, because I think as I've gone around and talked to safety directors and, and folks, the heads of companies, this is just a great tool for them to, to implement within their teams and, and create more knowledge and empower their teams. So what's our approach and our philosophy? Well, to those safety managers out there, they're going to be pretty familiar with this approach, and it's called the hierarchy of safety controls. And what we're, what we're taught is to go from the top down, as you can see. It's to physically remove the hazards or at least substitute or control away from them. But unfortunately, gloves are often the only go-to mechanism for controlling it. People just jump right to gloves as their first, uh, first method of controlling. So employers should be evaluating their work and the hazards against the hierarchy of controls in a consistent practice. And as a manufacturer of PPE, we obviously love to sell gloves, but you know, we understand that, again, it's not a silver bullet. Um, you know, I think one thing that I can share with you, I have a real world experience where this had happened on a major construction site or a, a pretty famous uh, um, IT or a pretty famous uh, company out there that is developing um, uh, data centers around the globe. So I was on this data center and um, they, this company was installing, they had these huge fans that were just monstrous, that were intake fans to keep everything cool. And on that had these metal strips of metal that had to be cleaned on a regular basis so that not only during the construction phase, but they were going to turn it over to the owner and it was going to be a, a preventative maintenance part of theirs to keep these things clean on a daily basis. So you didn't intake dust and particles and everything like that. But on these, at the base of them were these strips of metal. And you could obviously see with a naked eye, burrs and different things of that, where uh, you know people were getting their hands caught, punctures and different things of that nature. So as we're assessing the site, doing, a, doing an audit and going through everything, I bring it to their attention and say, hey, you know, is this something that you guys uh, fabricate on site or do you bring it uh, in from a manufacturer? And they said, this is something we bring in. And I asked, well, what are the chances of you, you know, grinding this down or maybe even the person who supplies it deburring this and, and, and grinding that down? And they say, you know, that's a great idea. Let me reach out to the manufacturer. 
So a week later, I got a call from the, the director of safety who I was with. And he said, you're never going to believe this. He goes, I called that company and I said, hey, listen, you know, those, those strips of metal that we're buying for the fans and, and things of that nature, what, what are the chances of you guys just grinding those down for us, you know, and is that something you guys even do? Their response was, well, yeah, we do that for anyone who just asks. And the, our, the safety manager said, well, what's that going to cost us? And the reply was, nothing. You just got to ask. So there, there again lies a great example of, you know, are we asking the right questions? Are we, you know, are there ways for us to reduce and eliminate physical hazards before they become that just by asking the right questions? So by doing this, what we're doing is we're seeing fewer and less severe injuries. You know, we're lowering the injury costs, lowering PPE costs. You're getting more productive workers in the ability to use lighter duty gloves that are less inhibited. But more importantly, I think you're getting better morale. And, you know, as you go out there and, and you talk to workers, if they feel they're being looked after, they feel that they're going to a safe environment and somebody has got their back, you know, they're going to be happy to show up to work every day. So from the book, we were able to devise an assessment tool. And it takes this application-centric approach and sticks to the principles and philosophies of the book. You know, sometimes out, an outside perspective can validate views and messages more effectively. You know, to fur, further validate that, you know, that approach, we were able to partner with some pretty large prime contractor construction companies to, to you know, take a consultative approach and devise a tool that can be used throughout construction. So through that, the construction hand safety guide was devised using a one-on-one -on -one meeting with hand safety specialists. And, you know, it's the recommendations are based on real operations data from the industry, not safety opinions. You know, we wanted to tighten our bind with the trades by showing them that we, we also had a lot to learn. So utilizing a tool that we created called the HSP hand safety program, we offer that same support and help our partners understand their current gloves and how the current gloves are being utilized. And, you know, if those recommendations match the hazard, you know, we go down, we work not only meeting with the safety folks, gathering that data, analyzing that data, but we went down in, in through trials and through feedback from the actual folks doing the task, getting feedback from them. We were able to gather that data and come up with recommendations. And then from those recommendations, we were able to put trials out into the field and get feedback, real-time feedback as to, hey, what do you like? What don't you like? What's not working? And really gather that data and, and have a comprehensive approach to it. You know, we partnered with many industry leaders and, and this approach has become a true partnership in evolving their safety culture as we gather essential information and data about their current culture. You know, our partners have ranged from companies like Gilbane, LeadCore, Turner Construction, DPR Construction, um, and you know, the list goes on. And I think what they've found is the benefits to this include better compliance, not only from their people, but also from their trade partners and a better understanding and education to their trade partners, which increases a buy-in at all different levels to improve that hand safety and, and improve the culture. And obviously a reduction in injuries and a reduction in costs because we're able to consolidate, create fewer injuries. And then what we were able to do for some companies is customize and build a customized matrix to meet the needs of those prime contractors that oversee many trades on many different sites and be able to kind of have something that's consistent from site to site for them. And then in the end, we also help them with specification language and safety plan language that better reflects a move towards creating that shift in the safety culture and gives, gives guidance to, to those that are doing estimating and bidding on those jobs. So conducting a third party on-site hazard assessment, it's been found to garner information that can help offer insight to, you know, in, insight into the potential causes to a higher rate of incidents. It also sometimes allows us to have workers open up. That third party 
um, conversation really sometimes allows these workers the ability to, to share things that they may not because they know it's not going to necessarily affect their job. They may not share it to the supervisor. They may not share it to their safety person because they're afraid it might affect their job. But, you know, we're a non-threatening person that comes in and just we're really inquiring about, hey, you know, what would you like to see? Uh, what's some features or what, what do you like? What, you know, what's not working? And they can really kind of open up and, and be heard. And from that, you know, we're able to bring that back in a non-threatening manner to the safety folks and say, hey, this is what we're hearing from your people. You know, we're not identifying that person, but this is what, you know, we're able to also help identify trends that might be happening. So how do we get the stakeholders to the table? Well, you know, taking a look at the complete picture allows for an open conversation, as we just talked about. You know, opens that conversation as to the best way to reduce injuries and to change that safety culture. And as companies are looking to reduce costs, it's important to factor all of the data in and look at the overall costs. So when we do this, we look at the data analytics, the cost benefits, you know, savings from reduced injuries, reduced downtime. Um, you know, I'll share with you one, one company had, um, I, I, I work with pretty closely now it shared with me that they calculated that one stitch is costing them $3,000 per stitch of like lost time, uh, investigations, everything of that nature. But we all know that you don't go, most guys don't go, and most girls don't go to the, uh, the emergency room for one stitch. So, I mean, if you're getting four or five, six stitches, that's $15,000, $18,000. And I think that buys a lot of gloves and it buys a lot of the right types of solutions if you can uh, identify them. So it's important that, you know, I think looking at the overall picture rather than a unit cost, we're able to really kind of paint a broad picture and say, hey, um, you know, I can tell you one company shared with me over the last five years, just one of their divisions was spending $1.4 million just in hand injuries alone over five years. And they have eight divisions. So doing the math, you can see that, you know, the right approach can not only send people home safer, reduce injuries, but it, it really can make an impact where it's seen from the folks in the bean counter world. So what have we, you know, what we've learned along with our contractor partners during this approach is that the cost of hand injuries, while we understand that the cost of hand injuries can be somewhat subjective, it was important to attempt to quantify them. Some folks weren't even quantifying that. So what we're trying to do is help them with this is to quantify, you know, not only what you know the workers uh, cost was to the employer, but for the prime contractor. We included injury time, first aid equipment, investigation time. You know, knowing this also helps tackle, you know, what's the cost of the first aid? You know, the cost of medical aid, like I said, you know, we've seen that the true cost of a stitch can be upwards of three to $4,000 per stitch. So, you know, we really do want to take a look at all aspects of that, not just throwing gloves at a problem, but really look at, you know, what are we doing? What's not working? And let's fix what's not working. So when we partner with these contractors to reduce injuries, you know, we help to change their culture. And what we were able to do is put together this construction hand safety guide. And really what we were able to do is take a consultative approach into helping design tools that can make changing that culture a lot easier from Joe's book on rethinking hand safety to a construction hand safety guide, which we're gonna send you access to. And this tool is a great tool to have when you're just one trade or if, if you're a part of, you know, one, one company that just does, let's say I, we do electrical, we do plumbing. We don't necessarily need to look at a plethora of different trades to put together a comprehensive program for our company together, but we sure want to make sure that our plumbers are taking care of or the guys that are working in our, our company. So this is a great starting point and jumping off point. And it also provides a great, um, a lot of great tools for education people. Uh, education pieces, um, toolbox talks, and different things of that nature to educate your, your workers. Excuse me. So, and the last thing is, you know, we try to, you know, utilize a one-on-one -on -one approach. 
do we come and meet with you that, that your needs are bigger than just maybe what the hand construction safety guy can offer. You want to design an approach that is, is customized to your company. So, you know, that's where we meet with you. That's where we figure out what your goals are, uh, figure out what your challenges are, figure out what things are going right, what things are going wrong. Um, you know, and these on-site hazard safety assessments can really make the difference to getting buy-in from not only your partners, but also those in the field working because they have a voice in the process. And you know, we develop that customized approach and then develop that customized matrix. So, you know, this, this, this hand safety guide as we talked about is a great resource and we'll provide that to you. And I think it's one that you're gonna find that as you look through there, you're gonna find ways to educate your workers, educate your team, and really just be more knowledgeable as you, you know, you're working to kind of develop a plan within your company. But if you wanna take a deeper dive, you know, what's involved in our on-site assessments? Well, we, took, we take a look at the injury statistics. We get feedback, like I said, from the safety professionals and the trade partners on their safety teams. We also observe the applications of the many trades and the tasks that go with them. One thing we understand about construction is understanding construction schedules. What we're looking at today, where this worker that's in this trade might not be what he's doing a week and a half to two weeks from now, whereas it might not be what he was doing two weeks prior. So we have to understand what the whole picture is, what a construction schedule looks like for that trade, because they wear multiple hats. So are we providing the PPE, not just for what we're observing today, but for what tasks they're gonna be performing in the future and what tasks we may not have been able to observe. So we go through a three week trial of the gloves that we recommend based on our evaluations. We get that feedback. We look at wear patterns, we get feedback from the workers. And really what we do is get a comprehensive snapshot of what might be best in all situations for them. And that's, a, that's an approach that we develop as a third party come in at no cost to the um, to the prime contractor, but it really does help them to develop a customized approach and then help to build from that a customized matrix for that. And everything does follow, you know, our hierarchy of safety controls. That philosophy is where we develop everything. As I pointed out before, where we find instances where we can look at, um, you know, different areas to, to reduce uh, potential hazards, we do that. And with this approach, we partner with you to design a company specific matrix, as well as gather important data into one report that will help create a broad view of ways that you can improve safety and reduce costs. It's an ongoing partnership. We understand it's a living document. So as things change, as technologies change, we'll bring those to the forefront. If we need to do beta testing on new technologies, We'll do that. I actually have some prototypes in with some of our large trade partners now that, that they were really excited about some gaps that we were finding in the market that we were able to develop some prototypes and there's, you know, they're trialing it for us now. So they feel engaged in that process that they're having a voice in what's coming to the market as well as they're getting the feedback and, and, and bringing value to their, their trade partners. So like I said, it's an ongoing partnership. And our goal is to change the culture of construction, not just find the right glove, but change the culture so everyone has a voice. And this can only be done by thinking outside the box and not doing the same thing over and over again, expecting that same result. Here's a good example of that customized matrix that we can help build. Now, in its real form, it's a PDF format that, you know, if you hover over a glove or part number on that glove, you click on it, it's gonna be able to take you to a data sheet right on that. And this is something that your safety professionals can have on their phones or on their iPads as they go out there on the job sites, as they're getting questions from their, their, their trade partners or they're seeing things that they can educate. It's real-time data and it's customized to what is the basis of design. And I think if you're in construction, we all know that that basis of design is really you know, what's recommended or what's preferred on our sites. Again, when you develop your language, you can, you can always use language that says, yes, you can use something that's different than what we recommend, 
but we prefer you get it approved, obviously, before construction starts. The same way as if you want to substitute a wall system, the same, same, same as you want to substitute a flooring that's been called out in specification. You, we feel that you should have that same kind of focus and that same kind of clarity in your language when it comes to safety. And when we work with the prime contractors, we're able to help develop that language. And this tool can be used to develop glove boards and visuals for your job sites so that everyone knows what's expected. Everyone's on the same page and it just allows them to have, you know, a complete source of information. You know, now that we have a company standard in that matrix, you can, like I said, start to easily build those glove boards, have on-site trainings, um, orientations, and really start to change the culture and shift the culture from the day they walk on the site. And that's essentially what our goal is, is to have that impact. Thus truly completing and implementing a program that's designed to, to really reduce hand injuries, but being able to track measurable results and data and see real progress. And by doing that, that's a true partnership in changing the culture. And that is our approach. And that's how we're working with the construction community. Rather than just throwing products, we're really working with them to change a mindset and develop tools that'll lead to better use of the right products. So with that, that really kind of concludes my part of the presentation here. And I wanna open it up to any questions you might have, but I do wanna thank you, if you don't have questions, for really taking the time and hope that this information was valuable. Thank you, Ian. Um, we've got some questions here for sure coming in, but we do have uh, time for a few more. So if you've got a question, please do enter it now. So the first one starts here, Ian, with a comment uh, that said basically here, I, I find that hand injuries are often sustained doing the most simple tasks. So the question here is how do we get our workers to take these simple tasks seriously and put gear on, even though it's something they think, oh, I do this all the time. It, it's not a problem. That, that's a great question. And, and, and that's probably, you know, that's probably a very accurate state. Um, I think what it comes down to is creating and finding a glove that or a piece of PPE that they feel can be just a second part of their an extension of their body where you're finding the right comforts you're finding the right gloves a lot of times what what you're talking about is is let's face it uh in construction you know and I used to do drawings I used to do CAD designs those drawing plans aren't coming out in paper anymore you know those those are coming out in digital format or if, if you need to reach your foreman, guys and gals are taking their gloves off because they can't use their phone. It's such a simple task, like you said. But what that leads to is the forgetfulness to put those gloves back on or the distraction that happens and the action that's taken afterwards, it causes the injury. So if we can create an environment where the minute they step foot on that site, you know, whether it be visual, um, reminders or nudges and things of that nature where they it just becomes a second nature to them that you know it's like they know they got to tie their shoes when they walk on a job site because we're trained it's something that's ingrained into us so i think it does come down to that culture but i think it's it's finding through trial through evaluations the right type of ppe that is going to make that worker feel so comfortable that they don't even notice that it's even on their body. Great, thanks, Ian. The next question, this is actually a favor they're asking. Uh, you had a QR code up on a slide earlier that linked to the construction hand safety guide. Is there any chance you can show that again? I do believe everyone's gonna get, get a copy they're of that. Going to, yeah, everyone is, everyone is gonna get a uh, access to a copy of the book. Everyone's gonna get access to that um, construction hand safety guide in digital format. And they're going to get, um, obviously, this, this video and, and anything that we talk about. And the ANSI guide that we talked about early on, the ANSI guide um, to all the standards for ANSI, which is it's a great tool that I've used for years. Um, so you're going to get all the access to that and, and obviously access to any questions you might have after the fact to reach out to myself with my information as well. Great. Thanks, Ian. So the person that asked that, you will receive that uh, automatically. Uh, next question here. Uh, first, a comment. Great presentation. Um, 
But the question here is, is there a CSA standard that is equivalent to the ANSI standard on cut resistance? Um, I believe ANSI supersedes that. I, I would have to take a deep, uh, deeper dive into this, um, the CSA standard, um, but I believe North America has just really kind of responded to the ANSI standard um, with meaning these are the testing methods that are used to determine what levels, whether it be cut, impact, puncture, or uh, abrasion resistance. Those are, you know, that ANSI guide when you read it, that when you get that out there, you'll find that um, there's a lot of good information that really highlights at what levels uh, those standards change and go up. Um, but as far as it being specific for CSA, I, I, I certainly, if they would like to reach out to me on an individual basis, I can do some due diligence and look into that a little deeper. But I know as a company, we definitely refer to everything as an ANSI standard. And, and that's where, if you look on all of our products, it has that stamp with the ANSI stamp that we have to put on them. Great, thanks. Good explanation there, Ian. Uh, next question. So when you roll out these new gloves, um, do you do a trial with workers? And if so, what, what does that trial look like? Well, that, that really, um, oh, that may have been asked early in the, in, in the uh, process, but with a construction hand safety, uh, with a hand safety program, we visit the site. We sit down and talk about goals. We sit down and talk about what things are working and get data. And then we go on to the sites and we make evaluations and observations. Then we come back with a report to make those recommendations. From that report, those recommendations, once we agree that, hey, everyone wants to give this a shot and let's put these things in trial, we provide those samples to the identified areas and we put those into trial for a couple of weeks. We get that feedback back and then really evaluate, are we on the right track? Do we need to maybe look at another solution? As a company that manufactures over well over 3,000 SKUs, I think, I think it's pretty safe to say we probably have a solution for most every issue, um, but it's really, is it the right look or the right product for that issue? So what we do is with that feedback, we, we identify that. And then from there, you know, we start to develop that matrix. We start to help roll that out and then work with you to, to develop a plan with your distribution or your distributors and your preferred distributors, because as a manufacturer, we sell through distribution, not direct, but we work with your distributor partners to help implement that and work with you to kind of make sure that, that everything is going to be rolled out in the proper way and also help you with the language so that going forward, no matter what project you're on, that language is a reflection of your new philosophy. That language is a reflection of your new culture and really the culture that going forward for, let's say your name XYZ construction, whatever projects XYZ construction is on, that's our new culture going forward. And that's our standard for our company. So we do kind of take a, a real cradle to grave approach. And then it's an ongoing partnership. As I said, as we, we uh, observe results, measure, uh, measure results, measure performance. And then if new products come out or new technologies, we want to be there to partner with you to make sure that you have those and access to those as well. Great. Thank you, Ian. Next question. I actually know the answer to this one, but I will let you answer it. Um, they want to know where, the, where, the, where your team is located and whether or not you provide the on-site evaluations and assessments in Canada. Great question. So I, we have territory managers throughout uh, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. As a construction specialist, I work closely with the construction companies and then bring our territory managers into the fold. And we work together as a team and I go on sites um, along with them to do perform those and, and meet with the safety professionals. So I, I currently, I, I live in, in Florida and don't hold sunny Florida against me. I did live in the cold climate for about 40 years, so I get it. Um, but yeah, I, I travel to uh, throughout North America and was just in Mexico last week on on a, a data center site in a brand new hospital meeting with a, a large construction company down in Mexico. So, you know, we're very interactive in that way. Usually we'll start with, with some, some meetings like this virtually, but um, getting on site, we do that proactively.
Great. Next question here has to do with um, the, the types of materials used in the gloves. So specifically, this question says, what materials are used for puncture resistance and are there gloves available that protect against needle, sorry, needle stick injuries? Absolutely. So there's a, to answer the last question first, absolutely. There are tests, there are ANSI tests that you will see on the ANSI sheet that you get or the ANSI uh, um, guide that you get that refers to either needles or probes. So there's two different standards that the ANSI tests for, but there certainly are materials out there. Um, you know, it, it, we manufacture our own yarns um, and, you know, some materials can be uh, high performance polyethylene yarns, HPPE yarns, we call them, or they can be Kevlar's. Um, but then there's different types of, of you know, uh, products that are or, or features that are built into these gloves that either make it uh, stick, pro, uh, stick resistant or needle puncture resistant to needles versus probes, per se. So it really, you know, there's a very uh, wide array of, of different types of materials out there. Sometimes it can be the coatings that can affect, help affect that. Um, it just depends on what level of protection they need. So my suggestion there is to reach out. Uh, let's have a conversation about the particular application and then kind of go into what might be best suited for that application. Again, rather than just saying, hey, I just need a needle stick. Well, you know, Again, we try to be a little more specific and a little less broad based when we're asking questions. Sure, and the next question, this is a bit lengthy, but I'll, I'll make it as brief as I can. So essentially this person's asking, are there any risk assessments that are completed to determine which gloves should be used when the cut risk is higher than the puncture risk or other factors such as entrapment? Um, so what they're saying here is, there are times when the cut risk is less than the impact or puncture risk, but the glove ratings are not easily transferable to the application. Does, does that make sense to you, Ian? Yeah, it does. And, and I think you have those different standards. And I think, honestly, getting eyes on that, looking at that can help with that. Because, again, you know, we, we manufacture, we manufacture, great example, we manufacture a glove now. It's, you know, again, one of the benefits of being a company that, that does manufacture our own yarns, that does have a really extensive research and development team, we're constantly trying to stretch the industry, you know, I mean, and that means push our competition, so be it. But we're trying to stretch the industry and we're, we're able to come out with uh, the thinnest glove on the market with the highest cut rating. The question is, does everyone need that? Well, that might be beyond what, what, what you need. Um, so what we really do is not just try to throw the highest impact, the highest puncture at something. We try to find something that, that really fits that individual need. And again, it does come down to looking at that individual application. They might need more abrasion than they might need cut. Let's say you got a Mason. Uh, Mason is dealing with a lot more abrasive products than they need cut. So, you know, we're really not, you know, a lot of companies, general contractors will have a minimum standard for what they're going to have as a cut. So you definitely have to meet that. But from an abrasion standpoint, you're going to want something that may be a higher abrasion because that is the hazard that you really are dealing with. So that it does make complete sense. And there is a way to get there. But I really think it does take having a conversation about the individual application and what the current, what, what you're currently doing, what the currently performance is, and, and maybe getting a set of eyes on that as well. Thanks, Ian. Next question. You touched on this during your presentation, but but maybe we'll just address it from a slightly different angle. Uh, sure. This is obviously from a worker uh, who's who's basically having a tough time making that business case to management. Uh, he said here that at his organization, um, the focus is on cost and cost and and nothing else, and not mm -hmm. the real protection that the product offers. So, how can how can you know workers convince management to take advantage of product advancements that? protect better, but might cost a little bit more? Well, it's like anything. Um, when you engineer things, the engineering of it's going to cost you more. And, and I get that. On, I get that. I think the best thing to do is, is to, you know, to start to gather the data. Um, you know, what kind of injury data do they have? What kind of, you know, statistical data do they have for injuries? What is it costing for injuries? 
uh, uh, you know, and, and really kind of do what, what I had shared with one of the larger, one of our larger trade, uh, one of our larger partners in, in the construction world did, was they really broke it down to what's the cost of a stitch? You know, we send a, a person to the hospital for, to get stitches and one stitch is costing $3,000. I think when you're able to produce those numbers, it gives you a better uh, standpoint, a better uh, uh, leverage to have a conversation of, hey, we're spending X amount of dollars here and we're spending, spending X amount of dollars on our, on our insurance. You know, what if we could reduce that? I mean, you know, I shared with you uh, and I shared with the group, we had a company that, you know, they're a large company, but they're spending $1.3 million over five years on hand injuries. So if you were able to cut that by 70%, you're going to see a dramatic change. And yes, if, if you have to spend a little bit more on a glove to get to that point, if it's the right glove, you're still going to see a bigger profit on that. So I, I do think it does come down to, to being able to have those conversations and get all parties to the table so that they understand we're looking at, at really not a unit cost. We're looking at an overall cost of saving, you know, the company money, but we're also, you know, I mean, really what it comes down to how, what's the turnover rate with a company? How much does it cost you to onboard new people? How much does it cost you to train new people if you can't keep the people you have healthy and safe? So there's all these factors that go into it. It's just really highlighting that and really putting a quantitative measure to that so that you can really sit down and go, this is the true cost of injuries versus, you know, what's it costing me per pair of gloves? I know it, it seems, you know, uh, like a, a, a pie in the sky type answer, but it really does, you know, come down to that. And you really can, once you get people who, or to the table, you know, they will understand that. And even those that are focused on cost can understand the overall cost. Great. Uh, the next question we've got here, I mean, I'm I'm just north of Toronto, so it's cold. It's cold in most of Canada. Sure. So I grew your... up in Vermont. I grew up right uh, an hour from Montreal. So I get it. Brilliant. But having said that, this question actually is looking forward to summer. Uh, the number one complaint uh, th that this contractor has uh, with workers on his work site is comfort. Um, and sure. and that, that being when it gets hot out, um, the gloves are too hot, the hands sweat, they don't want to wear them. Um, any, any, any tips you can give on that kind of feedback from a worker or are there new gloves on the market that are, that work better in, in heat on a construction site? Well, sure, sure. And, and I think it comes down to sometimes the material used. Um, and again, it really does take a step back and, and looking at what you're currently doing. Um, generally, when I hear that, it's because some folks think that, well, the only way I can get cut resistance is to use Kevlar. Well, Kevlar is used in the fire service industry uh, or, you know, para aramids, which are designed to prevent heat from getting in and also designed to prevent heat from breathing out of your hands. So a lot of times we see that with folks that are using Kevlar. So when you use a high performance polyethylene, one of the byproducts of, of our yarn is actually cool to the touch. It's breathable. Now, would you use it around in heat application? Absolutely not. It really does find in the right glove. You have to find out what the applications are, um, you know, if they're using it around heat applications, then you have to be somewhat specific as to what you're what you're putting in there because you have multiple hazards. Where if it's just a cut hazard and you're working in the summer or cut or abrasion, you can use a, 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 an HPPE manufactured glove or a, a yarn from an HPPE, which generally has more breathability and is cooler to the touch, but still because of the engineering can get you up to even an A9. Cut level. Thanks, Steve. And that actually takes. Oh, go ahead. Finish up. Yeah. No, but I, I just want to kind of just tail on that. I really do think it does come down to looking at the application because making specific recommendations without having seen it, it just opens the door to you know more questions and concerns. So 
I, I strongly encourage reach out, you know, we can have an, an offline conversation about that individual application for sure. Great, good point, Ian. And I was gonna say that actually takes us to the top of the hour. So we are out of time. So thank you to everyone who joined us today for this important discussion on hand safety in the construction sector. We hope you found it informative and helpful in your work. I know I did. I certainly learned something from you, Ian. So thank you for that. We would like to express our gratitude to our sponsors, Superior Globe, for their support in making this webinar possible. Uh, big thanks to you again, Ian, for sharing your expertise and insights. Uh, your knowledge and experience has been invaluable to this conversation. And thank, just to, thank, thank you. Yeah, no, it's great, Ian. Great, great presentation. And and just a reminder that hand injuries are preventable, and it's up to each and every one of us to take responsibility uh, to take sorry responsibility for our own safety and that of our colleagues. So we encourage you to share the information you learned today and apply it in your workplace. Thanks again for your time and participation. We look forward to seeing you at our future webinars. On behalf of OHS Canada and Superior Club, we wish you a safe rest of your day.